Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuation of the story Effie, Harry and the Dragons. The last time, I think my last words were, and yet there seem to be more dragons than ever. And do remember as well that there are other stories on Study Coach podcasts. That's right, Study Coach podcast. There are other stories for children, for young people. So anyway, let's continue with this story. It was not very easy to know what would poison a dragon because, you see, they ate such different things. The largest kind ate elephants as long as they were any and then went on with horses and cows. Another size ate nothing but lilies of a valley and a third size ate only prime ministers if they were to be had and if not, would feed freely on servants in livery. Another size lived on bricks and three of them ate two-thirds of the South Lambert infirmary in one afternoon. But the size Effie was most afraid of was about as big as your dining room and that size ate little girls and boys. At first, Effie and her brother were quite pleased with the change in their lives. It was so amusing to sit up all night instead of going to sleep and to play in the garden lighted by electric lamps. And it sounded so funny to hear mother say when they were going to bed, Good night, my darlings. Sleep sound all day and don't get up too soon. You must not get up before it's quite dark. You wouldn't like the nasty dragons to catch you. But after a time, they got very tired of it all. They wanted to see the flowers and trees growing in the fields and to see the pretty sunshine out of doors and not just through glass windows and patterned dragon-proof curtains. And they wanted to play on the grass, which they were not allowed to do in the electric lamp-lighted garden because of the night dew. And they wanted so much to get out just for once in the beautiful, bright, dangerous daylight that they began to try and think of some reason why they ought to go out. Only they did not like to disobey their mother. But one morning, their mother was busy preparing some new dragon poison to lay down in the cellars and their father was bandaging the hand of the boot boy, which had been scratched by one of the dragons who liked to eat prime ministers when they were to be had. So nobody remembered to say to the children, don't get up till it's quite dark. Go now, said Harry. It would not be disobedient to go, and I know exactly what we ought to do but I don't know how we ought to do it. What ought we to do, said Effie. Well, we ought to wake St George, of course, said Harry. He was the only person in this town who knew how to manage dragons. The people in the fairy tales don't count, but St George is a real person, and he's only asleep, and he's waiting to be waked up. Only nobody believes in St George now. I heard Father say so. Well, we do, said Effie. Of course we do. And don't you see, Eff, that's the real reason why we could wake him. You can't wake people if you don't believe in them, can you? Effie said no. But where could they find St George? We must go and look said Harry boldly. You shall wear a dragon-proof frock made of stuff like the curtains, and I will smear myself all over with the best dragon poison, and Effie clasped her hands and skipped with joy and cried, Oh, Harry, I know where we can find St George. In St George's church, of course. Um, 
said Harry, wishing he had thought of it for himself. Do you have a little sense sometimes for a girl? So the next afternoon, quite early, long before the beams of sunset announced the coming night, when everybody would be up and working, the two children got out of bed. Effie wrapped herself in a shawl of dragon-proof muslin. There was no time to make the frock, and Harry made a horrid mess of himself with a pattern dragon poison. It was warranted harmless to infants and invalids, so he felt quite safe. Then they joined hands and set out to walk to St George's Church. As you know, there are many St George's churches, but fortunately they took the turning that leads to the right one and went along in the bright sunlight, feeling very brave and adventurous. There was no one about in the streets, except dragons, and the place was simply swarming with them. Fortunately, none of the dragons were just the right size for eating little boys and girls, or perhaps this story might have had to end right here. There were dragons on the pavement and dragons on the roadway, dragons basking on the front doorsteps of public buildings and dragons preening their wings on the roofs in the hot afternoon sun. The town was quite green with them. Even when the children had gotten out of the town and were walking in the lanes, They noticed that the fields on each side were greener than usual, with the scaly legs and tails, and some of the smaller sizes had made themselves asbestos nest in the flowering hawthorn hedges. Effie held her brother's hand very tight, and once when a fat dragon flopped against her ear, she screamed out, and a whole flight of green dragons rose from the field at the sound and sprawled away across the sky. The children could hear the rattle of their wings as they flew. Oh, I I want to go home, said Effie. Don't be silly, said Harry. Surely you haven't forgotten about the seven champions and all the princess. People? who are going to be their country's deliverers, never scream and say they want to go home. And are we, asked Effie, deliverers, I mean? You'll see, said her brother, and on they went. When they came to St George's Church, they found the door open, and they walked right in, but St George was not there. So they walked around the churchyard outside and presently they found the great stone tomb of St George with a figure of him carved in marble outside in his armour and helmet and with his hands folded on his breast. However can we wake him, they said. Then Harry spoke to St George but he would not answer. And he called, but St. George did not seem to hear. And then he actually tried to waken the great dragon slayer by shaking his marble shoulders. But St. George took no notice. Then Effie began to cry. And she put her arms around St. George's neck as well as she could for the marble, which was very much in the way at the back. And she kissed the marble face, and she said, Oh dear, good, kind St. George, please wake up and help us. And at that, St. George opened his eyes sleepily, and stretched himself and said, What's the matter, little girl? So the children told him all about it. He turned over in his marble and leaned on one elbow to listen. But when he heard that there were so many dragons, he shook his head. Oh, it's no good, he said. 
they would be one too many for poor old Georgia. You should have waked me before. I was always for a fair fight. One man, one dragon was my motto. Just then, a flight of dragons passed overhead and St George half drew his sword. But he shook his head again and pushed the sword back as a flight of dragons grew small in the distance. I can't do anything, he said. Things have changed since my time. St Andrew told me about it. They woke him up over the engineer's strike and he came to talk to me. He says everything is done by machinery now. There must be some way of settling these dragons. By the way, what sort of weather have you been having lately? This seemed so careless and unkind that Harry would not answer. But Effie said patiently, It has been very fine. Father says it is the hottest weather there's ever been in this country. Ah, I guessed as much, said the champion thoughtfully. Well, the only thing would be... Dragons can't stand wet and cold. That's the only thing. If you could find the taps. St George was beginning to settle down again on his stone slab. Good night. Very sorry. I can't help you, he said, yawning behind his marble hand. Oh, but you can, cried Effie. Uh, Tell us, what taps? Oh, like in the bathroom, said St George, still more sleepily. And um, there's a, a looking glass too. Shows you all the world and what's going on. St Dennis told me about it said it was a very pretty thing. I'm sorry, I can't. Good night. And he fell back into his marble and was fast asleep again in a moment. We shall never find the taps, said Harry. I say, wouldn't it be awful if St George woke up when there was a dragon near? Besides, it eats champions. Effie pulled off her dragon-proof veil. We didn't meet any the size of the dining room as we came along, she said. I dare say we shall be quite safe. So she covered St George with the veil. And Harry rubbed off as much as he could of the dragon poison onto St George's armour, so as to make everything quite safe for him. We might hide in the church till it's dark, he said, and then. But at that moment, a dark shadow fell on them, and they saw that it was a dragon exactly the size of the dining room at home. So then they knew that all was lost. The dragon swooped down and caught the two children in his claws. He caught Effie by her green silk sash and Harry by the little point at the back of his Eton jacket, and then, spreading his great yellow wings, he rose into the air, rattling like a third-class carriage when the brake is hard on. Oh, Harry, said Effie, I wonder when he will eat us. The dragon was flying across woods and fields, with great flaps of his wings that carried him a quarter of a mile at each flap. Harry and Effie could see the country below, hedges and rivers and churches and farmhouses flowing away from under them, much faster than you see them running away from the sight of the fastest express train. And still the dragon flew on, 
the children saw other dragons in the air as they went. But the dragon, who was as big as a dining room, never stopped to speak to any of them, just flew on quite steadily. He knows where he wants to go, said Harry. Oh, if he would only drop us before he gets there. But the dragon held on tight, and he flew and flew and flew until at last, when the children were quite giddy, he settled down with a rattling of all his scales on the top of a mountain. And he lay there on his great green scaly side, panting and very much out of breath, because he had come such a long way. But his claws were fast in Effie's sash, and the little point at the back of Harry's Eton jacket. What's going to happen next? Join me for the next video of Effie, Harry and the dragons. Join me for the next video to find out what happened with Effie, Harry and the dragons. You have been listening to me, Morel Bernard. And don't forget that there are other stories on Study Code Podcast. So for now, see you. See you soon. Bye-bye for now. Be good. Bye.